Okay, so um, we're just going to step back a little bit and, and do a brief chazara on the uh, near the top of Lamed Zion on the bays. We did it last week, and I, I felt that we didn't do justice uh, to the to the to the uh, thoughts we were presenting. So um, we're going to go back maybe about eight or nine lines from the top where it says Omalea Bayalorava, because we were introducing the this whole concept of Bari Vishema. And I, and I, it, because we're comparing two different cases. So let's start from there. Omalea Bayel Rava. So we know we have a machloikis between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfin in the Gemara and Yavamas as to whether or not, if you steal from five, whether or not you have to give back to all five or whether or not you can uh, basically put it into the, um, uh, to the center of the court or whatever, however you want to look at it. And then the five of them have to figure it out. And Rabbi Akiva says no. So Amalei Abayi Larava, me Amalei Rabbi Akiva lo zuhaderech. Did Rabbi Akiva actually say there in Yavama is lo zuhaderech motzius midei aveda at yishal gzei lechol echad de echad? Did he mean to say that even though he stole from one of five, he's not yoytze? You know, in other words, he doesn't come out of the the cocoon of an avera until he pays to all five. So he has to be mashlum to all five. Alma mistake mafkine mamona. Therefore, we see from Suffolk, we do mafki, we do take out the money from the hands of the thief because the thief is holding it. So we take it out of his hands. So And we don't say that the money stays in the chazaka of, of he who is holding it and it's up to the others now to try to get it. So that, in other words, he's establishing what Rebbe Kiva is saying. Break the Gemara of Rebbe Then I'll ask you a kasha from a different Gemara. Yeah, that's the Gemara. Remember, we have our Mishnah, where the person comes and basically confesses that he owes money to someone who doesn't even know he's owed money. And then there's a question of what you do. So we say that you have to give to each one of them. Then you have that Gemara and Yavamis where the one person steals from five and some Machlekes, Reb Tarfin and Reb Yekiva. And now we have another Gemara. What does the Gemara say? I think it's in Bechayis, I'm not sure, but Nafal Habayas Olav Valimo. So we started talking about this yesterday. And, and this, by the way, Lahabdil is, is a big issue in civil matters as well today is if you have a situation like this where you have sort of simultaneous death and you have to determine who is the Irish because in simultaneous death there, there may be two different tracks of Yorishim. So Nafal Habayas Allah Val Imo, if a house fell down and he and his mo and mother were, were in the house and the Halokhe, I mean, it, it, in terms of succession, a, a woman uh, uh, in this case, the, the mother, let's say she doesn't have children, her son died, then it goes across and up to her father's line. Whereas from the son, it would go down, uh, presumably to his wife or, or down the line to his children. So you have two different directions. So it belongs to them. And, and the Yorshe Ha'em say, no, the son died first, because we don't know, it's simultaneous. Elu the Elu Modim, Shiyech However, everybody agrees that you do divide. In other words, the, the point is that there is a division. We're going to figure out what the division is, but there is a division. So if there's a division, then we don't say, Mare, right? Here we want to say, in, in our Gemara here, by the, uh, the Gemara Yavamas, actually. Um, what do we say that we don't say Ukamamona Becheskes Mare, because we say that you have to pay to everybody. But here, here we say Ukamamona Becheskes Mare. One way or another, it's going to be in Becheskes Mare, and it's either going to go to the son's Yorshim or to the mother's Yorshim. So he says it's a stira then, it's a kasha from that Gemara to the Gemara in Yavamas, where the Gemara says the opposite, that we don't keep it in the hands of the thief and everybody has to figure it out. We say he has to pay to everybody. So how do you reconcile the two Gemaras? One seems to go in one direction, saying that you can um, hold it in the Cheskes Mare, and one says you can't. So here, this is where we introduced uh, this concept, which I want to just go over again, because I think we, we did it fairly quickly. So, um, we all are familiar generally in the Gemara with the, with the concept of Bari Bishema. In other words, one person's a Bari where one person says something very definitively and the other person's a Shema, he's a maybe. So when you have a, a, a Bari and a Shema, then you go after the Bari. Now, if you have a Shema and a Shema, two people who are totally non-committed 
because they don't have the specific answer. So Shema Veshema, you look at differently. You don't necessarily say one Shema gets it over the other Shema because they're sort of equal. Omale, so Rava said to Abaya, Hosam Shema Veshema. So he wants to say like this, that um, in the case of the mother and the son, you have a Shema and a Shema. Why? Because you're sitting there and you just don't know who's getting it. I mean, who died first? We have no knowledge. So no one has a, a sort of a foothold over the other person. So therefore, that's clearly a Shema Veshema. And Shema Veshema, as Rashi says in the first large Rashi, you know why the the the, the nechasim are in their chazaka, in their respective chazaka, because nobody knows anything. I mean, they were sitting in the house. We don't know what agreement they came to, so we don't know. So we have to put it in cheskasim. That's why you can say in that particular case, ukemamona becheskas mare. Why? Because it's it's totally neutral. Right? So, um, however, um, um, look, okay, so, so I'm sorry. So let's back up at just the line of the Gemara. Uh, let's just finish. And Rabbi Akiva says, and what does Rabbi Akiva normally say? Rabbi Akiva is the machmir, and he says you have to pay them all. So Rabbi Akiva admits that the nechosim are the cheskas mare. Um, so, so, so the right. There, in the case of the mother and the son, shema v'shema. We, we agree, Shema Veshema. Gosel Echad Mechamisha. But if you steal, if he steals from five, then Bari Veshema. Then it, it's a Bari Veshema. What's the Bari? The Bari is that, that there, there was a theft here from one of the five. You can't figure out from which one. And from each one, each one there's a, to each separate one, there's a Shema. Why? Because when this one comes, he says, oh, you stole from me. And he says, mm, maybe, maybe not. And, and that goes down with all five. But in the eyes of the, of, the, of the person from whom it was stolen, it's definitely a bari. So it's not comparable to the case of the mother and the son, because of the mother and the son is totally shema v'shema. So therefore, the, even there, Rabbi Akiva would admit that it's cheskus bari, right? Um, so, but, but in the case where there's a ganef, and we just don't know how to reconcile that one Ganef? He says it's Bari Veshema. So the Chara, that should be iron out Rabbi Kiva. Frek the Gemara, Bahamas Nis and the Hacha. What about our Mishnah? Remember, we have three cases. We have the case in Yavalmis, we have the case of the mother and the son, and we have our Mishnah. Bahamas Nis and the Hacha, Amal the Shnaim, the Zalti Lechet, the Kemone, the Shema Veshema, you. In other words, he says, I sold from one of you a Mana. What is that? A Shema and a Shema, because they don't know anything. They're being told for the first time that there was a theft. So that's a Shema Veshema. Ukutani nos lozem mana velozem mana. And you say that you give to each one a mana, which means what? That you are not ukama mana becheskis mare, that you're actually taking it out and giving it to them. So then the chara now that's a steer on Rabbi Kiva again. Because Rabbi Kiva, in other words, we want to find consistency in all these cases. And yet we see in this case, we don't say ukama mana becheskis mare. We may say it in the case of, of the mother and the son, but we don't say it in our Mishnah. It's Frek the Gemara. Your premise is that, that it's Rabbi Akiva who's saying that. Rabbi Akiva he. How do you know that that particular comment comes from Rabbi Akiva? In other words, he's trying to justify and say that there isn't a steer in Rabbi Akiva because maybe it's not Rabbi Akiva who's saying it. Frek the Gemara. Mamaid Rabbi Akiva he. How do you know that it's Rabbi Akiva? So he says, no, I know it's Rabbi Akiva, because it says the words if, if the whole discussion is between the Akiva and the Tarfin, and it says, who is he being Moida to? So he has to love Rabbi Akiva, 
it has to be Rabbi Akiva, who is his nemesis, who is his bar palukta. So again, so then now we're back to the square one. If it's if it's Rabbi Akiva, how do you reconcile? In one case, we say Ukamo and Becheskus Mare, and in another case of Shema Veshema, we say you have to pay. Why do you have to pay? Ukamo and Becheskus Mare. Let them figure it out, just like over there. So the Gemara takes a different tack now. Okay, so we can't reconcile Rabbi Akiva. Umamai the Shema Veshema who? So you're okay. So it is Rabbi Akiva. We, we, we established, but why is it a Shema Veshema? Umamai the Shema Veshema who? Why is it a Shema Veshema? Because Sof Kal Sof, there was a theft. It should be more comparable to the case of the five, uh, the five and the one, because there was a because there was a theft. So why do you say it's a Shema Veshema? Maybe it's not a sh- maybe it's a bori vishema, and then it's not comparable because that's a bori vishema. So we say that you have to pay. But when it's a shema vishema, ukemamone becheskes mare. So once again, we're trying to find a way not to have a skira in Rabbi Akiva and for the Gemara. Two reasons. Chada the lokatani tovan also. It's very interesting because it doesn't say tovan also that they went to sue him. Now, when would you go to sue somebody? You go to sue somebody when you know you're in the right because you're owed something and they're denying it. Here you have two innocent guys who are just sitting and they're not doing anything. And you're coming to them and you're telling them, oh, I think that your father gave me money or I stole from you or whatever. They're just sitting there calmly and peacefully. So that's definitely Shema Vashema because if it was Bari Vashema, then they would be suing him. So there's no, so, so, so that's one terrorist that it's Shema Vashema, therefore, fine. Therefore, um, uh, it's not a kasha. What and and the ba'od? What time did Rabbi Chia? Rabbi Chia learned ze oma ani yodea, ze oma ani yodea. Oh, um, this one says any yodea. This one says any yodea. What is what does Rashi say right away in our Mishnah? For ukmalo babolo tziside shomayim. He is coming to do the right thing. Here we are, Erev Rosh Hashanah, and we want to do the right thing before Rosh Hashanah and make sure that if there is a half a minute that we owe some money, we should pay it or whatever the case may be. So therefore, it's even a bigger raya that it's that it's no one, there's no bari here. It's a shema v'shema, in which case, so therefore, when, when, when a ganav comes and he wants to l'shem shemayim, then we say, go ahead and pay. So, so in other words, this isn't a regular case. This is a case where he comes out of his way to want to do the right thing. And, and we're telling him, you want to do the right thing and you think you took from one of them, then in such a case, you pay. So it's no raya against Rabbi Akiva, whether he holds Ukum Mamona Becheskis Mari or not, because here he's volunteering that he wants to pay. What would be the case where he wasn't volunteering and it was a case of, uh, do I owe or do I not owe? That, that already, so that we have to leave uh, to, to the Machlaitis of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Akiva. But it's no raya against Rabbi Akiva because we're talking about uh, a different case. So th- this is the, what I wanted to bring out again, because the whole Indian of Bari Veshema and Shema Veshema changes the whole contour of the Machloikis between Rabbi Tarfan and Rabbi Akiva. And um, so we want to say over here that in our case, you can't bring a raya against Rabbi Akiva. We know it's Rabbi Akiva because it says that he is, that he is the Baal Puluk, that he's the, the, uh, the opposite number for Rabbi Tarfan. So we can't we can't get away with that. We're trying to sort of salvage Rabbi Akiva here and not make him the um, uh, the uh, the center of this piece. But there's no way around it. He it is Rabbi Akiva, but still we say that it's a different situation because he's going out of his way uh, to to want to pay. So who's going to stop him? He wants to do the Mishur Sedin, and he wants to. Leave. So where's going? I mean, he's giving stucker. If, if it doesn't turn out that he owes it, fine, he gives stucker. But um, so that's how the Gemara answers the Kasha. So now and and we're left. The Gemara leaves us with this question of um, what would actually be the case between Rabbi Kiva Tarfin and some of these others. So, and again, so, so Bari Vishema is one way of looking at it, that when a person is a Bari, then you have to pay. When, when a Shema Vishema, you don't have to pay. And the other way is just to say that um, you can't bring any rias because we're talking about s- someone who wants to do the right thing. Just like we are here before Rosh Hashanah, when we have any doubt, let's just go in the right direction and make sure that um, that we're doing the right thing. Okay, so that's a, just a brief chazara on that piece. Now, we're gonna go back a, a, a couple of often 
And we're going to go back actually to Lamed Zayin Ahmed Aleph, where we had the discussion at the beginning of the wide lines, if you remember, um, where someone was a, um, a, a shomer, he, he was holding uh, an item to somebody else. And, the, and, and from the Mishnah, we said, Shnaim Sheftidu Eitzel Echad, right? Two people gave a, a, a picotin, uh, something to hold to one person. And the question was, is that person negligent in not knowing who gave it to him? In other words, I give you something and, and you just put it down and put it away and someone else gives you something. And later on, we both come and say, we gave you, in one case it was $100, one case $200. And, and we say, we gave you the $200. Well, clearly that's not the case. So we go to the person and say, who gave the $200? Says, I don't know. I mean, you put it down by me and I said, I'll hold it, but I wasn't particular as to what it would be. So there, the Gemara on Lama Zion and Aleph by the wide lines makes a chilek as to whether or not the two of them came together kind of separately or they came together as one. What's the difference? Well, of course, the difference is that if they came together and, and with, a, with, a, with a, an appearance of being separate, then he had a responsibility to see what was being given to him. But when two people come together and they sort of bundle their stuff together and one says, oh, I've got 100 in here and I've got 200 in here, then we say, if you guys aren't Machbid, you're putting it in one bag and you guys aren't Machbid because you trust each other, who's giving the 100, who's giving the 200, you can't put it on the showman, on the on the, uh, the guy who's holding the Picardin to know who gave the 100 and who gave the 200. So that's the distinction as to how you look at the, how the money was given to him, either, either with a, an appearance of being separate or not. So now our Gemara here, on Lama Zion, on the base, says as follows. Okay. Amalei Ravina Ravashi. Ravina says to Ravashi, Umi Amar Rava Kol B'Shtei Kruchas Habalei Lameidak. Does Rava really say? Because Rava is the one who says that, that if, it's, if it has the appearance of two separate um, bags, he should have investigated who gave the one and who gave the two. And therefore, he's responsible. The Shomer is responsible to give back the right amount. Frank Ravina to Ravashi, is that in fact the case? Well, Amar Rava, the Itamar of Papa, we see from another from another Gemara that uh, Rava says, or a Papa, a Komodim Bishnaim Shahkido Edsa Roe. That there's a brisa over there where two people came to a shepherd, each had some sheep, and they gave it to the sheep. He was he was tending to a flock, and they just added to his flock by giving him sheep. A Komodim Bishnaim Shahkido Edsa Roe. Then they come back and said to the Roer, I gave you two sheep. And the other one says, no, I gave you. But clearly only one gave two and one gave one. What do you do? Says the Gemara over there. And that Brysa, that he turns around to the two of them. He puts the sheep in front of him and, and, he, and he steps away. In other words, you guys figure it out. So, so therefore, that's a raya against Rava. Because Rava here says that the, he would not be responsible, uh, but that you are responsible uh, b- because you should have seen who gave the one and who gave the two. Why over there in that Gemara do we say no? So Ravashi said back to him, Okay, so it, 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 they did it sort of clandestinely. They came, he was busy with all the other sheep, and they slipped their sheep into the pack. He never even saw what was given, but he, you know, before he had 15, now he has 17 or 18. So he doesn't even know. So therefore the Gemara says, you can't hold him responsible. But we, from this we learn that if he were to actually know what was going on, that he would be responsible. So in other words, the, the, we take away the responsibility because he didn't even know that they were adding the sheep the, it, it, to his pile, to his, uh, to his flock. But otherwise, they, he would be responsible. So that's how the Gemara, the Gemara wants to understand why there's a chilek between that brisa and ours. And we say, because there it's a different set of facts. But if the facts were the same, then you would have the same problem. And what is the problem? The problem is that when you are a, um, a shomer and someone is giving you something, you, you should not just sort of be in the clouds. I mean, you know, don't be a shomer unless you know what you're doing. So if someone comes to you and says, I want to, I want to, uh, I want you to hold it for cotton.
Rose, can't hear you. See other people moving, so I don't think it's my end. I didn't do it. <laughs> All right. You're two against each other, then, then you're not going to put a bigger burden on me than you have on yourself. Okay, so that's the chilek now between that Gemara and Argomar. All right. All right, we're going to clean up the, the rest of that Mishnah. We have one more chilek of that Mishnah. And the Mishnah says, if, if you go back and take a look, um, it, it, the, the Mishnah adds not only a case of two people who come with money, but also two people who come with kalim. What does that mean? In other words, two people come with vessels. One is a nice vessel, and one is a super beautiful vessel. And they give it to someone to hold. And he doesn't keep track of who gave him what. And the same problem arises where they say, I gave you the nicer one. The other one says, I gave you the nicer one. So what do we do? But here, the Gemara takes a different approach. The Gemara says, why are you telling me this? You already told me that by money, what the halacha is, why do you have to tell me by Kalim what the halach is? What are you adding by Kalim that we otherwise don't know by money? That's the question that the, um, that the Gemara asks. So says the Gemara, Tzricha. I need both of them. In other words, I have to have the case of Kalim and I have to have the case of money. Why? The <laughs> Iash Hach Kamaisa. If I only have the first case of money, Okay, so we have a machlekes between the Tanakama and Rabbi Yaisi, right? Rabbi, Rabbi Tanakama says, you get 100, I get 100, 100 goes to Eliyahu. And Rabbi Yaisi says, oh no, um, I'm not going to allow that. The whole thing has to go to Eliyahu, which means that even the guy who's not telling the truth is going to take a loss. And the theory is, I'd rather, he, he'd rather not take a loss, he'd take just take his own and walk away. Okay, that's the theory of, of Yaisi. And the Rabbanans say, no, we're not going to penalize uh, the the the, um, the other person to, to the extent of 200, at least they'll get 100 back. So it's a different philosophy in whether or not the, the, the Rama, the cheater, gets away with it or not, but you don't want to penalize the good guy too much to at least give him half of his money back. So says, says the Gemara, in, if I only hear a, Okay, so, so, so this Gemara is trying to tell us that there is a chilek between Kalim and money, and therefore when the Mishnah says it repeats the same thing twice, first with money, then with Kalim, we need both. Break the Gemara Tzricha. Why do we need both? There are identical situations. Why does the Mishnah have to tell us first with money and then with Kalim, the very same facts? So the Gemara is, it says Tzricha. The Iashmin and Hach Kamaisa, if I would have only the first case of money, in that case, the rabbis say Mishim Deleka Peseda, because there is no monetary law. I mean, there's this there's loss of a hundred dollars, but at least he's getting a hundred dollars back. And and so I'll, I'll at least let him have a hundred dollars, and the hundred will go to Eliyahu. So that's what he means by Peseda, that there isn't a secondary loss. But but in the case of um some Modele Rabiosi, so um, in other words, if we only have the first case, then he would say um, that, um, that, okay, you, you can give him the money. But, but if you were to ask the Rabbanan, well, what about in the case of Kalim, the same, it wasn't in the Mishnah, and they just asked the rabbis, what about the case of Kalim? Is it the same? He would say, no, it's not the same. I, I, I agree with Rabbi Yesi that, that no one gets anything because there's going to be a major loss because you're going to take that beautiful kli because Rashi says, Shibarti, you break the kli and you have to give him a portion of the kli, literally. So he says, uh-uh, that I'm not doing. So if we didn't have the case of the kli, the second version, then the rabbi, we wouldn't know that the rabbis agree and say that even in the case of the kli, you break the kli. Rather, in other words, we have to have that case for the rabbis to say, yes, I'm allowing you to break the kli in order to give him $100 worth. 
and the rest of it stays till Eliyahu. So in other words, and this is a classic case, by the way, in all of Gemara, is, is when the Gemara asks, why do you need two examples of the same thing? It's because one of the examples would exclude the other. If you only have the money and you say, okay, m- money is money. So you give him money and $100 stays till Eliyahu, no big deal. But in the case of a Kli, where you have to take a beautiful vase that's an heirloom and you have to break it and take a piece of it and say, this is worth $100, I'm giving it to you. No way I agree. I'm, I'm with Rabbi Yaisi. The whole thing should, 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 should be deferred to Eliyahu Navi. Teretz says, no. The rabbis say, even in that case. Now, of course, Rashi elaborates and says, we don't mean physically breaking it. We mean selling it and taking the money. But the Havamina was that you were breaking the Kli. And we wouldn't know that the rabbis say in that particular case that you're allowed to do that. Therefore, we need both cases, the first and the second. The, now, what about Rabbi Yossi? Does Rabbi Yossi need both? The E, Itma Baha'i, if you have only the second case, Baha'i Kama Rabbi Yossi, then we would say no. Rabbi Yossi says that in the case of money, I could say to go to Eliyahu because after all, I mean, we want him to have some, some monetary loss as well, right? Um, but in the case of the Kli, where you're doing damage and there's real damage to the Kli, then Rabbi Yossi is not going to say, wait till Eliyahu and Ovi comes. He would, he would say, you know, go ahead and, and try to do something now. So in other words, no matter how you look at it from both sides, we're saying both the, the, the Rabbanan and Rabbi Yossi need both cases because each one would have an exclusion of one set of circumstances over the other if you didn't have both. That's, that's the Gemara's te- text. Okay, it makes sense. But then the Gemara has another kasha on the top of Lama Ches So if you're going to say that it makes sense why both uh, the Rabbanan and Rabbi Yossi each agree that you have to have both cases, the, the underlying principle for Rabbi Yisim is Hefzad Aramai. So if it's Hefzad Aramai, what does it matter if it's a Kli that has to be broken or money? That's not what matters here. As Rashi says, What's the difference between Kli and Mos? Where would you even get the, the, the opinion, the idea that in the case of money, Rabbi Yeshi admits to the Rabbanan, same kasha. You're making a mistake here because you think that Rabbi Yeshi is concerned about the value of the, of the kli, that it's too nice and everything else. Therefore, he'll concede to the rabbis that, um, that you can give half of it or, or sell it or do something. That's not the case. The whole underpinning of Rabbi Yeshi's position is because Hafsad Aramai. Hafsad Aramai transcends whether it's a kli or money. So the kasha is the same kasha. According to Rabbi Yaisi, why do you need both? Just say the one and, and say that the principle is Hefzad Aramai, and I'll know that any time th- there is a theft, Hefzad Aramai is the number one principle. What does Hefzad Aramai mean? It means that we don't, we, Rabbi Yaisi says, if the, if the real thief is going to lose money, he'll get cold feet and he'll back out and he'll say, no, 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 I made a mistake because he doesn't want to lose his hundred dollars. So the theory is we're going to press him against the wall and he'll admit. If that's the case, then there's no chilik between Kuli and Mos. He's either going to admit to it because he doesn't want to walk away with a, uh, with a hundred dollar loss or he won't admit to it. So the same kasha that the Gemara asks before is still a kasha on Rabbi Yaisi, not on the, on the Ramana. So what do, we, what do we do with it? And to the Gemara, el tervay el Rabbana, no. Rabbi Yossi is not doesn't enter into the picture here as a player in this discussion. The whole discussion is about the rabbis. What do the Rabbanon do? do? Do they need both or do they not need both? The rabbis need both. And we use a principle of below zu afzu katan. And it's a famous principle of the Gemara where um, the Gemara says, it's 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 a, a refrain for not only this but that. In other words, you go from the easier to the harder, from 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 the easier to the harder. And you say not only this but even that. So what does it mean in our case? So in our case, what it means is um, says Rashi the Rabbanon itzrach la Ashmeinan milsa the Rabbanon tenehu We need both. 
the etana kalim. Now, the etana kalim beresha. If the first case of the Mishnah was kalim, not money, you're absolutely right. If the first case in the order of the Mishnah was kalim, we wouldn't need money because madach kalim, where you break it and everything else, you say you can do it. The money, there's no question, of course. Aval hashta the shone the tani most beresha. The order of the Mishnah that the Tanoim put together was money was the first case. Right, money was first, and then the second case was Caleb. Tony Caleb, the name of Lo Zubova, the Lekka Peseda, the Shemir Kli, Afsu, the Ike Peseda, Gadol, Amin and Hafi. But so, but not just money where there's no Hefsit, you say that you go ahead and do it, then, but even so, Kli, where there is a Hefsit, you also break it up so that that, so that, that one owner doesn't walk away with nothing. Now, you, we can all sit here and postulate and say, why did the Tanon do it that way? I mean, it, right? It would make sense to put the stronger case first, and then you have no need for the weaker case. That's what the Gemara says, lo zu afzu, that sometimes, and, and I'm, I'm, what the pattern is, I'm not 100% sure, but sometimes the Tanon, when they put it together, they say, you know what? We're going to go from the easier to the harder. We're going to go from the kula to the chumra. And we'll tell you the kula, but then we'll also tell you the chumra. You can ask, but why do it that way? And, and the Tanan would say, because this way we articulate two cases, even though they're similar, but they're not identical because they deal with different items. And therefore, we're, we're, we're postulating it very, very clearly. I mean, that's the best, really, that I think we can say, unless someone has a better answer as to why the, the Tanoim didn't come along and say, let's just talk about Kalim, forget about money, and we'll know that, that it's a Kalvachay Mamad, or Kalim, of course, money. But then we wouldn't have the principle of Lozu Afsu. The whole principle of Lozu Afsu is, is kind of the opposite of a Kalvachay because it's saying not just this, but even that. So, it's so another okay. So, so that's what we're holding. So we have to. So the answer is that the Mishnah has both cases in order to accommodate the Rabbanon and to fulfill the understanding of Lozu Afzu. Uh, but, but we could sit here and ask that question and say, well, why didn't they do it the other way around? I'm not sure that's a good answer unless someone has an answer. Yeah, go ahead. There we go. Sorry, I don't have an answer, but I have a question. So uh, what all this sort of reminds me of, if we could almost in a certain sense have a third case, which is Shlomo Melech with the baby, the two women claim that they were the mother and split the baby. And of course, that gets to the whole you know, idea of Rashi saying here, you don't split the vessel, you sell the vessel. You know, uh, and of course, um, you know, the whole thing I figured out the one who who uh, the one who was OK with splitting the baby was the one who wasn't the mother because uh, no mother would actually never do, do that, such right. A, right. But um, so one thing that we don't mention in the Kayla even right is, is the idea that you would, you know, you talk about an heirloom vase. It's not just that it's an expensive vase, but an heirloom, which is that the idea is that there's sent can be with an object with money. Money is fungible. It doesn't matter. But with an object, uh, it could be with artwork or whatever, where it actually has sentimental value so that so for one person, it's actually literally worth more that to the, than it is to the other person. Or and the that, and that person on the open would market. say, don't break it. And that person would say, don't break yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you could, you could, you could take that argument. You could say it. The Gemara is not saying that here, but I guess in theory, you could say if something was so expensive, uh, a, a, a person's conscience would bother him that they uh, that they have to destroy it as much as you would have to, you know, take a child and destroy it. But um, but again, it, it's the principle here. What, what we're trying to show, I think, is that um, in this particular Mishnah, you might have been able to go the other way, and you might have been able to say that yes, of course, we talk about Kalim, and therefore anything beyond Kalim is, is, is Pasha. It's, 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 it makes sense. Um, the, I think what the Gemara is trying to do, and, and maybe that's what the, the, the intent of the Tanarim were, is that, you know what, we're going to establish a principle here that we want people to understand. Sure, we could have said Kalim, and there would have been no question. But if we say money, and then we say Kalim, they were sitting around and they were saying, why do you need Kalim? 
And they say, you know why? Because we want to establish a principle of lo zu apsu. I mean, it has to be that way, that the Tanoim themselves, as they were going through this, were thinking this through. It wasn't just happenstance throwing out a word here or a word there. They were thinking about it, and they say, you know what? This is how we're going to establish the, the principle of lo zu apsu, because it, because we go from the easier to the hard, and we want everybody to understand that even though there are identical cases, th there are different considerations. That I think is what the Tanar really were about, is they, is they were setting a pattern for the future so that the, this prince, otherwise, how would we know the principle of Ozu Apsu if we didn't have this kind of progression from something that was less, um, of, of, you know, less, less concern to a greater concern? Anyway, again, the, 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 the Gemara is a blueprint to teach us, um, to teach us uh, halacha at the time, it's not halacha, but, but as, as to how to think, how to think. So we have, on the one hand, we have a Kalva Chomer, and the other hand, we have Lozu Apsu, and they're each important principles. And here, the, uh, the Gemara, the Mishnah, the, Amor, the Tanoim are laying down the, uh, the basis for um, why we come up with Lozu Apsu. Okay. So, it's so from this uh, rabbi, I once had a teacher, as a friend of Rucha, who, um, who was familiar with the considerable scholarship there has been written about just the extent to which Rabbi Yehud Anossi edited the Mishnah. Right. We went about it, and, and I'm sure you're familiar with some mm -hmm. of it too. And, and a lot of it reflects just what you said about that they were anticipating <laughs> what are you going to learn from what we're saying now? Right. And, and that's how they said, and, and a lot of it had to do while many of these were random discussions to begin with. Right. Yehud Anossi did something to put them together in a, in a in, in a format that would later on be exactly right, right. Exactly right. That was the godless of Yudanasi is that he had the forethought to, to, to see that all that all the and by the way, the, the Mishnah was much, much larger than what we have here. He had to exercise large sections of, of the Mishnah because they didn't fit into how you wanted to present it. This Mishnah could have been three times as large. You could have had many more Tanoim who were quoted, but, but he did it with a certain seichel, as you say, so that it, it's, it's as concise as it can be, but also covers the principles of, of, of Shas. Take a look in Shas and all the principles that, uh, that we discuss and where they come from, and they, are, they obviously start from, ta from the Tanoim. The Tanoim of all uh, over Shas have, have made uh, uh, different principles. And, and, they, and they cross over different volumes. I mean, you can have something in, in Makis that goes to Bechorus or Baba Metziah that goes to Kedushin. And when we have that, that's why if, if, if we, we sit and learn and we learn different Masechtas, all of a sudden, and Daf Yomi is, 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 is perfect for this, is, you know, the theory comes up in, 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 in Chulin, but wait a minute, I already had that in, in Sanhedrin because these are repetitive and, and, and they come up in different contexts and it was Rabbi Yehuda Anas's tremendous work to organize it so that um, so that it all held together. So that's the beauty. That's the beauty of the Shas. Okay, so let's just start this next Mishnah. Um, it's a Shem next week we're going to be learning next week. So so let's start this next Mishnah, uh, and um, and we'll obviously have to pick it up. So here we have a different set of circumstances. and this, by the way, is classic because you always ask yourself this question: Amafki perishes lechaveru. If, if I leave something with you and it, it, it could potentially be spoiled, what's your achrayas as a shomer to protect me? So, so, that, so the Kama says, don't touch them, keep them in the way they were given to you, even if they're going to spoil or, or they're going to be, um, you know, the, you, know, you keep them in the, uh, the barn and the rats are going to get them. Lo yiga bohem. That's the Tanakam. Rav Shimon Gilil Omer, no. Mochem it made Bezdin. Yeah, Bezdin and because we'll pick it up next week. So that um, uh, we're, what we're saying is a machleik is between Tanakama and Rav Shimon Gamliel as to what is the reason why, um, uh, in other words, why you do or do not try to redeem someone's um, um, uh, possessions if they're going to spoil in your possession. Because that's a question that comes up all the time. Okay. So let's just touch on the beginning of the Machlaikis. My Tama, what is the reason for the Mishnah, the Machlaikis? Amar Rav Kana, says Rav Kana, and this is a very famous statement, which we've, we've, which we've definitely already seen multiple times in our learning. 
or A person would rather have a much smaller measure of what he owned or what he physically worked on than, than nine times, 10 times what he can buy. In other words, if you can do something with your hands and produce something that has chashivas to you, even if it's smaller in value or in kamos or echos, than something that you can buy for the same money and get much more of because there's a personal satisfaction and that you have worked on it. So therefore, when I give you a mashkin to hold, it's because that mashkin has value to me. I don't want you to go ahead and sell it, even if you can sell it and redeem it for, for, for money, which would be a greater value to me. The principle of Rav Shimon Gamliel is that, that, Rotsa, that a person wants his own, even a smaller measure. For Rav Nachman by Yitzchak Omer, Rav Nachman by Yitzchak um, um, says a different reason as to why, um, and this becomes a little bit more complicated, that the reason why you don't touch it is, and, 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 and here we'll just touch on this and then we'll hold to next week. There's a machloike, the, the principle is, if you um, have produce, you have to give first truma, you know, right, truma, 140th, 150th, 160th, you give then masa rishon, and then you have to give masa sheni or masa oni. So you have to give a whole bunch of things from your produce. Kasha, if I live in New York City, okay, and if I live in, in Yerushalayim, and I have a field that's in, in um, uh, let's say, uh, 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 Haifa, Beersheba, and I have a big, beautiful field, and I want to say, I give you, okay, so when I give you, according to, according to this version, if I've given you something to hold for me, and it's really truma, because I gave truma this is truma for something I own in Beersheva, then you're holding my truma. How can you sell my truma and, and exchange it for something else just to save my money? Then someone is, a non client is going to eat truma, right? Because the, what I gave you was truma designated for a parcel somewhere else. If I'm allowed to do that, according to Rav Nachum by Yitzchak, then you're holding my truma. You don't know it, but you're holding my truma. So the whole principle of, oh, I'm going to save him money because I'm going to sell it and, and make sure that it's preserved. What are you selling? You're selling truma. A non cohen can't eat truma. So basically, you're now committing an avera by, by, by protecting my interest, but by giving a non cohen truma. Right? Does that make sense? So in other words, the, can everybody hear me? Yeah, so, so the machloik is, just to finish, the machloik is in Rav Shimon ben Gamliel, why, why you are um, either allowed or not allowed to do it, is a machloik is a myroim between Rav Kana and Rav Nachman by Yitzchak. Rav Kana says that you don't do it because a person would prefer his own than someone else's, so don't relinquish, uh, even though he can make a, a lot more, uh, have a lot more produce if you sell it, don't sell it. And Rav Nachman Yitzchak says, don't sell it because you may, be, you may be selling truma because you're allowed to long distance designate truma on another property. So th th that's that's the two shittas, the two amaroim in Rav Shimon Megamliel. Next week, Mitzvah Shimon will pick up on that. But it, it's an interesting principle. One has to do with my personal gain is that I like I like what I do. I like my handiwork. So don't sell my handiwork um, and 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 keep it for me, even though there's a potential of loss because, uh, because the mice and the rat or the time may eat away at it. Shimon Gamaliel says no. And, and, um, and, and, and uh, Rav Nachman by Yitzchak says, no, very practically, there's a practical reason why you shouldn't sell it because it may be truma, it's Suffolk truma. And, it's, and, and Suffolk truma, I mean, there's an Isidoraisa here uh, potentially. So you can't do it, you have to hold on to it and uh, whatever happens, happens. Okay, so Mitzvah will stop here. I'll make sure my computer works well next week. Um, and we'll pick up from this Mishnah and go weiter. Uh, so everybody, Ksiva, Ksiva Tova, a good bench to your, have a, have a, um, uh, a, a internally, externally um, uh, strong, strong beginning to the year. Chuvitz, Philip, Sadaka. And we should all be Zaycha Mitzvah to a wonderful year of Torah. And we, of course, we hope for the Mashiach, but if he doesn't come, 
then we should continue and maybe finish Masech the Papa Metziah <laughs> down the road here just a little bit before the next uh, Rosh Hashanah. Everybody. Oh,